Hey everyone, we're going to be starting in a minute or so. Just trying to get everything ready, ready to roll. It says it's streaming live, so <clears throat> I'll give people, particularly my wife, in case for some reason it's not broadcasting, um, can't hear me or something like that. And unfortunately, that does happen from time to time. I'm just setting one other thing up. Hopefully I won't mess it up. Maybe. Oh. Okay. So where is it? Oh, there it is. I know, talking to myself. <laughs> um, yeah, there we go. Okay. So I have it live. Um, we're live on Abundant Grace, uh, I cross post to uh, my ministry page, Legendro Ministry, for those of you who want to follow me. Uh, oftentimes, just so you know, on the Legendro Ministry page, I talk about things that I don't talk about related to our church fellowship. Sometimes it's not that it's a, a wrongful thing, it's just that sometimes I'm processing something and I don't necessarily think it's, it's for uh, our church fellowship or it doesn't have as much function in our church fellowship. I do maintain my same kind of things. I don't, I don't deal with politics or anything like that uh, there. But I think all of us are in a process sometimes of finding different things that are coming up. So like I say, you can, you can find us on Abundant Grace Fellowship. That's our, our, our church fellowship page. Legendro Ministry. I know there's people, <clears throat> excuse me, that that share our our, our posts, uh, that kind of thing. So you may be seeing this through a friend's uh, newsfeed or something like that. So I, I certainly don't mind that. We we appreciate that. Uh, anytime you you share what we're doing, uh, it opens the doors to people that may not be hearing and. You know, it used to be that when we did something like this, it was easier to have people, you know, gather and sit in somebody's home and watch it. But that doesn't happen as much now for for, for a number of reasons. We're still handicapped a little bit in the sense that <clears throat> even though they've changed the, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the mandates in our state, um, and that affects, you know, restaurants and things like that can move up to capacity. Motels still have a, a, a different heading that they, they try to stay under. So anyways, all that to say, that's where we're at. So it's 10 o'clock. It's actually a minute after. So my name is Lee Jondro. I'm with uh, Abundant Grace Fellowship here in Keene, New Hampshire. I welcome you this morning. You know, you may want to, you know, I'm going to be talking about refreshing. I, I began thinking about this weeks ago and started sharing on it last week. But uh, one of the things I noticed is maybe it's because it's in some respects the, in quotes, the anniversary of COVID putting people into isolation that it seems like, or it has appeared by my observation that people are really struggling because it's like all of a sudden maybe there's the real thinking that it's a year out of my life or something like that. It's interesting. I was watching a uh, TV program the other day and there was a guy, he had been in jail and he came out of jail and he purposed in his life. He never wanted to go back to that way of thinking again. He didn't want to go back to jail, so he became a businessman, and he did good things for good people. But because of his past life, someone stepped in from his previous life when he wasn't doing great things, and they wanted to kill him. And they said, you don't seem to be afraid that we're going to kill you. And he said, since the day I walked out the door of the jail, I made a decision in my life that I would live every day to the fullest, and if this is my last day, I'm okay with that. I don't want to die, but I'm okay with the fact that I have devoted myself towards making me a better person, doing what I can in the community where I live, 
and making my community better for others. And I think that's something that even though, you know, it was a secular TV program, I, I think that's something that we need to look at as believers. And, and I do think that, unfortunately, one of the things that has happened in the last year is we've forgotten how to do things. We haven't been as innovative. We haven't been as, um, what's the word, inventive in our solutions to what we're going to do with other people. You know, we, I'm not saying, you know, people drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, but, you know, for many, many reasons, people weren't able to go into hospitals and nursing homes or something like that, or they had different conditions, you know, in homeless shelters. So how do we reach these people? And, you know, as a ministry, we reach people, um, where they're at. And I've spent the last year trying to be innovative, trying to take what we were doing already. You know, we have some great people on our team um, who work with young people and prepare a meal for, for the local homeless shelter where we live here in Keene. And each week they bring in, they bring in food for 80 to 100 people on a weekly basis and have been doing that for a long time. So I think it's important though, when every circumstance doesn't break out like it did before that we make decisions to keep the kingdom moving in whatever capacity we have um you know somebody said i received a, a note in my nonprofit about giving and many people know that many people receive stimulus checks um over the last couple of days and you know the question came up what do i do with that you know and uh, you know in part i believe that part of what we're to do is to stimulate the economy now for some people it may be the connection between having a place to live and not so do what you need to do to take care of of business but when it comes down to whether you know last week we received a uh an offering that was dedicated to the homeless and we passed that on uh, to the shelter. It wasn't a lot of money, but I know that person. And while they're not part of our ministry here, I also know that that amount of money was a lot of money for them. And so I'm grateful for what they gave. And so when people talk to me about giving, if you look in this post, you'll see there's a thing called Tithely that'll either take you to the website or you can download the the app itself. And the app works pretty cool in the sense that it will remind you, do you want to give this week? Do you want to do this? Do you want to give to the homeless? You know, there's a bunch of things that happen in that app. So COVID changed a lot of things. But what it didn't change is the heart of the father towards his people. And so today I want to continue on. Last week I began a message and uh, it was on entering his rest. And I'm going to continue with that today. I actually, for those of you who are in our fellowship, you may have seen that I posted up a midweek uh, addition to that a few minutes, probably 10 minutes. But today I'm going to continue on. You can watch our messages on YouTube, Facebook Live, uh, or you can listen to the podcast. But I want to make sure it's presented to people in every format that's capable. And a year ago, I probably, in, in all sincerity, wouldn't have thought like that. But now I see this vehicle as much as I struggle with the fact that there's not people in a room with me. I, sh I, I know this is the vehicle that I'm to use in this season. By the way, speaking of rooms, um, there's somebody in our fellowship and... I saw you came in late. I had had the room open earlier and I waited for about, and it wasn't about you. It was, I, I left it open for 20 minutes and no one, no one came in and I saw you came in and I was already in the middle of preparing. So I just want you to know that I appreciate you and I care about you. And I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't pick that up. One day we'll be back to kind of more normal things. So father, first and foremost, before I share anything related to the message, I ask you, Lord, to bring healing and wholeness into people's lives. This past couple of days, my wife and I have talked about people that have been suffering mentally and emotionally. And so, Father, I pray right now that emotional healing would come, that 
in the midst of their thought process that they would have the wherewithal, that they would appropriate the grace to uh, cast down every thought that exalts itself against the name of Jesus. And so, Father, I ask for blessing to come upon each and every person who listens this morning, who follows us, and uh, I pray great grace upon you. Grace, grace, in Jesus' name. Um, I know my wife and other people, by the way, and I can't see this because I'm easily distracted. Uh, they're in the Facebook Live, so if you have a prayer request, you can just send them a note. Um, you know, maybe we'll figure out if there's a way going forward that we can actually do different things. But right now, that's what we have. So if you need prayer for anything specific, um, I'm greatly encouraged. I, I've mentioned in the past, I have this friend who just goes around healing people. Uh, he feels that's all he's supposed to do. And God bless him because he does an amazing job. And I think healing is the children's bread. Last night, in the middle of the night, I was up around, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning. Who knows with the time change. Uh, I didn't change my sundial and <laughs> I was laying there and I was thinking that healing has already been paid for. And so we just need to take it out of the bank account. So I want you to think about that. If you need healing in your body, you know, let, let, let's see this thing happen. Let's see his kingdom come and his will be done. So let's talk about entering his rest. I want to read your scripture from Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 12. This is where uh, this particular topic comes from. <clears throat> Therefore, and, and again, King James, I apologize, but this is how I had it. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also both ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I mentioned last week, I, I believe it was, uh, that you might want to get a Weist Bible, W-U-E-S-T. And you might want to, even if you just go online, it's not an online Bible. It's not available online other than to make a purchase. But I think there's a couple of web pages that may have this particular group of scriptures, Hebrews 4, 9 through 12. And, and hopefully it has the explanation there or the commentary, because, you know, in my early years, I was taught flesh bad, spirit good, and the sword comes and separates the flesh from the, I don't believe that anymore. I believe it pierces this way, that, you know, this is flesh and spirit, they're attached. And when this comes in to, tear, to divide asunder, that's the method and the manner it does it in. So that, that, that scripture tells us that we need to labor into entering that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. To be in faith is to be at rest. Oftentimes I use the example, as do many other people, about Jesus being in the boat storm all around him disciples all upset thinking they're gonna all you know be in davy jones's locker or something and jesus is sleeping and they wake him up and he's like what the heck is this deal and he speaks calms the storm he's sleeping the storm is going on um being the spiritual person he is 100 percent man 100 percent god i have this intuition or this suspicion or even this prophetic thought process that had this been a death opportunity, Jesus would have woken up, but he was at rest. So the devil's opportunity to kill him wasn't going to happen. Jesus's full trust was in, in the Father. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Last week I gave you two tips to enter into his rest. One was to begin to meditate upon scriptures, and I will share some of those in a moment. And the other was to begin to pray in tongues. If you don't already do that, uh, I would encourage you to do begin to do that. Um, Jesus tells Matthew, it tells us in the book of Matthew, not to worry about what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, that even the pagans run after those things. And, but your heavenly father has a knowledge of your need before you do. 
He goes on later to say in verse uh, chapter 11, verse 28 and 30, come unto me, all you that are labor, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In 1995, I remember exactly where I was when I got a revelation of my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I immediately saw the light of day, the Father, the, the like, like the sun came down. It didn't just mean that it was weightlessness to me. All of a sudden, it took on a new meaning, that my yoke is easy and my burden is light, meaning that you carry the fullness of everything. Within him, there is found no shadow, it tells us. There is a lightness to the weight we do not have to lift. And there is a lightness like the light coming in through the wind pipe. And so I shared about this scripture. I read it to you in the message last week. For those of you, uh, you can look up Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, verse 30. If you go look it up in the message, you'll see it talks about this idea of rhythms of grace. That grace ebbs and flows. It never goes away and it never goes out of your life. But there are times where you may need grace, grace. And there are times where grace, grace has been provided for, but the need isn't that great. But it's still there. So there's this ebb and this flow in the kingdom of God. And, 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 it, and it's called the rhythm of grace in the, in, in the message Bible. So what does it mean to rest? It means to cease, if you will, from worry and fear. Oh, here goes Lee. He's telling me not to worry about things. Okay. I wouldn't ever tell you to worry about things. The Bible tells us in another portion, it tells us to cast our cares upon the Lord. Take that weightiness of worry and put it on the Lord. Lee, I've tried this. Okay. What I'm teaching you today, and I believe so strongly in this, even in the middle of the night when I had that thing about healing, I, I, I laid there and I reminded myself that this would be a great opportunity. I have challenges that are in my life with my wife and myself. And, and they're not, you know, they're, they're not terrible, but they're not what we expected. And, and so they touch on areas of our physical beings. They touch on areas of our finances. They, and, and, and yesterday we had to spend a lot of time just thinking through what is the best thing we can do. So I lay in bed in the middle of the night and, and I began to behold the Lord. Behold the lamb who was slain. I began to see his face in front of me. And I, I stared into those eyes of love. And, 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 and I don't know how that all works, just so you know. God is everywhere, but he's personal. And I've tried to think that through, but here's where I'm at. It's bigger than me. And I'm content to believe God is great and his goodness goes forever. And I'm also content to believe that in my moments, he's personally available for me to bring comfort. So it's to cease and to, from worry and fear, and when we walk by faith and we walk not by sight, we are at rest. When faith arises, and everybody's been given a measure of faith, and I'm not talking about the, the, the faith that we read about, the gift of faith or the, um, the uh, what's the word I want, manifestation of faith that found in 1 Corinthians 12. But the gift of faith, that, you know, that gift, that manifestation, I'm not talking about that. that. That is available to those who yield themselves to the Spirit when and where you need it. But I'm talking about the faith that says, I believe God. I believe God is personal. I believe God is big. And I believe he's greatly to be praised. And so, in the middle of my beholding the Lord last night, and I'm not even sure why I'm telling you this, but I found myself starting to say, thank you, Lord. I'm grateful. And then I thought, if one of my children or grandchildren began to talk to me and they said, you know, they said, thank you for what you did for me. I'm grateful for that. I would be excited about that. But if they continued on for 20 minutes, I would be uncomfortable. 
And what I realized was God wants that personal relationship that isn't here to here, but is here that I can have a real conversation with God. And that gives me peace because I know that he cares about all the hairs upon my head, what few there remain, because the Bible tells me that. So I want to make sure that I stay in this place of faith, if you will. I believe that God will come through on his promises. That's a place of my faith, that when I see a promise, whatever that is, for instance, I'll give you one that I spoke about earlier this week. You can see it on our YouTube channel. It is not, I don't think it's on our Facebook page, but if you go to our YouTube channel, or you subscribe, it's under Abundant Grace Fellowship Church, you'll see that I put up a post or a video, a short video, about he'll never leave you or forsake you. That one you can take to the bank in my world. You can take all his promises to the bank. But sometimes out of those 3,000 plus promises, we run across a situation, we find the promise, and we're not so sure. But it's when we begin to appropriate that in faith that we begin to see the uh, reality, if you will, of God. And, you know, I... I I, I've said to, uh, in, in, in recent days, it's been my grandson, Jacob, you know, and I've talked to him about faith. And one of the things I've said, you know, I say, okay, when you come down this week, we're going to go to the antique store to help him with this project that I do with him on a weekly basis called Lee and Jacob Generations. Or on Saturday, we're going to go have coffee together and we're just going to hang out. And we do that. He knows that I'm not going to break that promise. He knows that as much as he would like to do a lot of things, I will say, what are the big things you want to do this week? And he'll say, I want to go to the motorcycle shop, or I want to go see a couple of my friends who live in the area, or I want to go have coffee, or I want to go to the antique store. And I'll say, what are the most important things to you? And, you know, kids will go everything sometimes. But... We get to that place, you know, what is the, what is the most important thing? And, and he knows I won't waver from those things. If I say I'm going to take him to see his friends, he knows he can take that to the bank. I think if you were to ask him, I've never broken a promise like that. And I have no intention of it. I keep things simple. I don't make commitments to lots of things. I don't push people off and say, well, let me think about that. Um, the only time if you're trying to make an appointment with me, I'm trying to figure out what's the most convenient for you and I, I may say to you, give me a day to think about that so I can see where it fits in my schedule. So <clears throat> if, if I wouldn't do that to a child, then I don't absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, do not believe God would do that to me. And so that's how God really wants us to be with him. He wants us to be, if you will, in faith. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm going to maybe cross some lines here. But there's a scripture in the Bible that tells us that we can ask amiss. There's also a, 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 a few scriptures that talk about as we mature in him, we see what he is available for. You know, when I came into the kingdom, I was taught, Whatever you pray, God will answer. Well, I prayed a lot of things. Time I was in the middle of a divorce. Time I was, you know, my, my business, I had five stores. I was just lots of things were swirling around me. And some of those things did not happen. And, and I look at retrospect and, and, and while, you know, I'll, I'll use the topic of God hates divorce. It didn't change the fact that I ended up being divorced. It wasn't what I wanted, but that's where I ended up. So I have a choice or had a choice and still have a choice. I could be very disappointed, discouraged, angry, whatever with God, or was that a promise he made to me? And I think that as believers, at least for me and where I've come from, we've taught, ask anything, 
much like a little child. I want this and I want that. Or, or am I the only parent whose kid can spend a million dollars and before they eat breakfast? <laughs> you know? I think God answers prayer. I, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I absolutely believe that. Excuse me. I absolutely believe that God can answer prayer and does answer prayer and wants to answer prayer. But I also think that we need to look at what we're praying. And, and I'm not making excuses for God. God's not going to fall off his throne because I say this. But I think that, you know, if, you, if you've never seen Bruce Almighty, it's worth watching. Not because I'm a Jim Carrey aficionado, because I'm not. Um, but you see that he starts to, he wants to answer everybody's prayer. And all of a sudden, everybody wins the lottery. I'll give you that little tip. But that God's not like that. At least I don't see him like that. I'm not talking about my experience. I'm talking about what I've read about God. So I put my faith in him. And I believe that he already knows whatever I have a need for. Now, it doesn't mean I'll say, you know what, Lord... Uh, there's a problem with this, and I'm asking that you intervene in this situation. I don't throw it up half-heartedly. I believe in it, and then if it happens, I'm excited, and if it doesn't happen, I'm not disappointed. By the way, I am not talking about healing. Healing is a provision of the Lord that is not about a prayer. It is paid for. It is part of the finished work. It is the people of God that need to learn to appropriate that. It is not the only prayer that Jesus prayed that was an if it be thy will prayer was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in there, he was like, you know, I know that I was destined to die, but I'm not so sure today is looking like where I want to be in this. He was in pain. Tells us he, he prayed with, you know, beads of beads of blood and things if it be thy will but when it came to that person's dead he didn't go hey god you know if it be thy will would you uh wake up this person's mother or this person's child no he didn't pray that way i'm not trying to rabbit trail but i do feel like i am because maybe it's because we're close to easter i am kidding so how do we labor how do we labor to enter into God? The same way we fight the if you will good fight of faith. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ and we cast down every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Does God want you to prosper? Yes, I'm not talking about Cadillacs, cruisers and condos. Does God want you to prosper? And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt the answer is yes. John tells us, "Beloved, I desire that you would prosper and you would be in good health even as your soul prospers." And I could tell you hundreds of scriptures related to prospering well, Lee, I don't, I don't see that was Jesus' life. Well, that's a whole other conversation. I just tossed this on the table. Who was Judas in his life? You will find, if you will, he was the treasurer. Which, he was also greedy, and he had some things going on in his life that we know about. And he was disappointed when a woman took, you know, hey, if she hadn't taken that, that, that uh, ointment, which is, you know, everybody's favorite word, uh, if they if they hadn't taken that that ointment that this woman who probably was a prostitute put on Jesus's feet and wiped his feet with her hair and her tears, he was upset about that. He said it could have been sold to take care of the poor. So people were giving into that ministry. I think the problem we have is when we see the disparity or it doesn't happen to us, you know? And again, I don't know why I'm going there. Um, I'm going to encourage you to put your faith where you believe it's to go. If it's for a car, put your faith behind a car. If it's, you know, for a house, put your faith into it. But maybe you just need to go spend a little time and find out what God would have for you. 
when Jesus cursed the fig tree, he didn't wait around to see if it actually went through. He just did it and he walked away and he kept on going. And he walked in the God kind of faith that he had no doubt and no fear and no worry, just rest. So the more we work to stay in faith and to completely trust God and to rest in him, then God goes to work on our behalf. I know some people disagree with me. That's okay. This is my takeaway. What I don't, God does. And what I do, God doesn't. So I mentioned some verses. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You're welcome to have that discussion with me. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read all these scriptures, but I'm going to give them to you. And I know my wife is probably typing them in, but I encourage you to begin to meditate upon these scriptures. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. Matthew 6, verses 25 through 33. 1 Timothy 6.12, and I will read that one. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, where, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. You know, friend, young friend of mine, I'm going to stop for one second. Actually, yes, I'm going to stop there for a second. I'm going to give you a few more scriptures. A young friend of mine, who I love dearly, he's half my age. I'm 65. He's 32. Um, he and I are doing a uh, podcast. It's called Bridging the Gap. And this week, our topic is going to be social media. Social media, aside from the fact that it has the potential to be one of the most anti-social media um, platforms we have also has the ability to remove your faith and what do i mean by that i have faith that god is big and greatly to be praised i have faith that god can do anything oh, did you see joe is dying did you see sister sally sick did you see the government is going to hell in a handbasket? I'm quoting you just for the record. Some of the things I see on social media. My immediate response, if I see Sister Sally is going to die, I'm like, that's not happening. Because the Bible tells me that there is no weapon formed against me that will prosper, but every tongue that rises up against me, I will condemn. Every tongue that rises up against wants to remove my faith and cause me not to, to be in a place where the only thing I have is believe it or cast it aside. I will tell you that most people do not cast things aside. And they see, and we've watched it through COVID, We've watched, I did, I did a, uh, the, the one I did about God will never leave you forsake or nor forsake you, that video, that short video. I also did one on giving and everybody goes, well, you, that's all you talk about. No, it isn't. But what I've noticed is when we stopped being able to find the vehicle for time, talent, and treasure, we began to see people doing this and we began to see people doing this. Now I've told my wife and I've told a few friends that if this is the line where we were a year ago, I'm going to tell you that the majority of people that I know and have talked to tend to be below where they were a year ago. Well, Lee, of course it's COVID. There is no weapon formed against us that will prosper. COVID shall not prosper against us. And that has to be the confession of our faith. If we sit there and we read, Sister Sally is going to die, and we don't speak against it. I'm not talking about going in and typing it. That's between you and how you do things. My, I, I long ago gave up trying to bring correction on Facebook or Twitter. Now, if you make a post and you're a dear friend of mine, or you're in the realm that I think would listen to me, I will send you a private note and say, how did we get there? 
Is that really what you believe? And I will dialogue with you because I'm interested in what is stolen your, your faith. You know, why do you not have joy? And, you know, so in the midst of COVID this last year that we just celebrated a year of, I only have a couple of friends in my life who have gone above and beyond where they were a year ago. Many people are suffering or going through difficult times, physical health, financial health, emotional health, mental health, all those things. And I'm going to say to you, I'm not disappointed in you. I'm not angry and I'm not out of love for you. But only yesterday I said to my wife, as we were doing some things together and we spent a lot of time talking about a lot of different things. I want to exhort people. I want to remind people of who they are in him. But I also don't want them to feel that I don't think they're where they need to be. Casting our cares upon him who cares and, and being willing to let go of things, I think is the most important thing we can do because <clears throat> why would you, you know, if I gave you a 50 pound bag of flour <coughs> and excuse me, and I said, walk downtown, you might be able to do it. On the other hand, it would be a burden. So why do we want to carry around the burdens that don't belong to us? That's my question. All right, next scripture. Hebrews 4, verses 3 through 11. Psalm 46, verse 10. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 17. I'm going to read that one to you. You can say, hey, Lee read an Old Testament scripture. I'm just kidding about that. I, people think that I don't think the Old Testament is relevant. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Next verse for your notes. Exodus 14, verses 13 through 14. <clears throat> so, you know, I think it's important that we don't get weighted down with the, weight, the, the weights of the world. If you choose to do that, I'm not sad with you. I'm saddened that you think that's your calling. Many, many years ago, I read about this intercessor. I read his book. The church I was part of in my beginning years was very much into intercession. We had morning intercession at six o'clock in the morning. I carried that over into my own fellowship. Years later, we gathered at six. At noontime, we went home. Every day, Monday through, I mean, every week, Monday through Friday, we did that. On Sunday morning, I would show up in our church fellowship at six to seven in the morning. I would pray. I would worship. I, you know, others knew they could come if they wanted and I would worship. And when we hit 10 o'clock, I was ready to rock and roll. I tell you that because there was this intercessor. And if you want to know the name of the book, ask, send me a private message. I'm not going to denigrate. And, and it's not for denigration. But this person took on the burdens of the people that he prayed for. If Sister Sally was sick, he would take on her burden until he died. And he died fairly young. And I don't think that's in keeping with the Lord at all. But this book was kind of an intercessor's handbook. And I believe we're all called the intercession. And I do believe some people practice it more than others. I'm going to say I don't see an office of the intercessor. I think we're all called to pray. You know, just like it says, when you give, give cheerfully. It says, when you pray. And Jesus 
gives us what we call the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. The Hebrew word for rest is nuash, to rest, to be quiet. Sometimes it's synonymous with, the, with another word in, in, in uh, Hebrew called Shabbat, to cease from or to rest. It is, we are always in the Sabbath because the Lord of the Sabbath is the Lord Jesus. The, 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 the Hebrew talks about Lord Sabaoth, S-A-B-B-A-O-T-H. But it is only a part, it is only a characteristic of who he is. It's not a who he is. But Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. It tells us that in the book of Hebrews. And if I'm in Christ, I'm in the Sabbath all the time. And if I'm in the Sabbath all the time, then I'm in the Shabbat all the time, except when I decide not to be at rest. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's important. Well, Lee, what's the Greek word? Glad you asked. The Greek word for rest is anaposis, A-N-A-P-A-U-S-I-S for your notes. And it means cessation from and refreshment. Christ's rest is not from work, but in my work, it is not from, the, from being active, but in my working or my harmonious actions of being in union with Christ, I can be in the rest of God. It is not I just lie on my couch and call it a done deal. Sometimes it's going out and praying for someone who is sick or someone who has a need. And in that, I'm still at rest. Because while the finished work is finished, God's work through his people is not completed. And it is out of that place, if you will, of the finished work that I have the power and the capacity and the capability to do what he has asked and called me to do. Now in the dictionary, and the, this is from Vines, it describes rest as quiet, calmness, tranquility, peacefulness, serenity, and stability. I'm gonna read that again. Quiet, calmness, tranquility peacefulness, serenity, and stability. If you and I have a lack of one of those meanings of rest in our life, it is time to stop and determine what we are doing that is not allowing us to be in his rest. So I'm going to read you some things that don't usually do lists, but in this case, I feel it's important. I'm going to talk about the things, you know, there's, there's verses in the book of James and things, and it talks about works. Paul describes our works, our, our personal works, or our own, our own righteousness as filthy rags. God is not looking for you and me to do his work. Me, let me clarify, to do his work because he didn't do it. He's looking for us to do his work in harmony with who he is and his working through us. So there are things we do that are not in keeping with his goodness or his righteousness or his peace or his joy. So what can we do to cease from our own works? lacking faith in God's word or rejecting his word or having an unbelief in his word. That would be our own work. That's pulling us from the place of rest. <clears throat> Last week I said, meditating upon his word, one of the greatest things I've noticed in my walk of 31 years, soon to be 32, is people don't read their Bible. People don't read their Bible. Now, I understand that there's been what we call a deconstruction. And, and, and no one embraces that more fully than me. But God's word 
is available to us. And by meditating upon his word, if you feel like God left you beside, I talked about this in the, again, that video I did about not being left or forsaken, not, you know, God's not going to leave you. <clears throat> there are people that are going around who are disappointed. They're discouraged. They're angry at God. They feel like he left them in the muck and the mire. He hasn't answered their prayers and he does not care about them. If that's you, no one can see you raise your hand, but I'm talking to you today and I'm saying God loves you. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, take your hand that you raised, put it over your heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, as my sister or my brother, put their hands over their heart. I declare that there would be a release of light and levity, that they would begin to laugh and they would see your kingdom come and they would recognize your presence afresh. <clears throat> God is not too far. Unbelief in departing from the living God. God is alive. If you choose not to believe that, that's your own work working against a place of rest. Hardening of the heart. Now, a hardening of heart can come through sinful actions or being wrong in things we do. I was reading just yesterday this story about, I would tell you that I was afraid to go to the Father if I was wrong in my early years as a believer because people taught me that he could crush me like a bug. So the very first time, and I remember so, so clearly that I had done something wrong, that I had sinned, I could not hear God talking to me. And I went to a friend of mine, his name was Tommy, and I said, Tommy, I got to get out of here. I got to quit. I can't hear God. And he goes, what's going on? And I told him straight up. And he goes, Lee, the fact that you are concerned that you sinned against God tells you that the Spirit of God never left you. And it was in that moment, no matter what anybody else taught, I knew that I could come to the Father. Don't harden your heart. We can, one of the works we can do, and we need to stop from, is we need to stop relying on our own wisdom, our own intelligence, and even stop trying to manipulate things to make them work for us. Oh, Lee, I would never do that. No, we've all done that. Let's just stop. You know, I learned to do something this way. So when this situation comes up, I go to do it and it doesn't work. I've been guilty of relying on my own intelligence, my own wisdom. And I tell you that to say, I get it. I get it. Learning to give the Lord glory helps us turn away from our actions of unbelief. It helps us to enter into that place of rest. Learning to find that place of rest, find that place of peace, even just going outside and sitting in front of your where you live and looking into nature and meditate upon the nature of God. Meditate upon that. Accepting his grace. Don't hold your hand up and say, God, I can't do this. You know what I did. Until... I'm not going to... I'm putting the brakes on. Until we recognize that our own shortcomings keep us from who he is. We will always try to do things in our own strength, our own mindset. I'm not telling you one and one that no longer equals two, but I'm telling you in God, one plus one is greater than two. And I don't mean it's not the number two, but you plus the Lord 
And at one point I taught, you know, I'm here and God just helps me. And another place I taught, lowly am I, like, you know, Jacob saying, I am a lowly worm. And, you know, what I realized is that his great love for me, I'm in partnership with him. I, he's my brother. He's my father. He's my king. He's my Lord, he is the grace that operates through my life. Do I always have it figured out? No. No. I run up against it. I'm faced with a very, I don't know what the word is, an emotional decision. It's not one I want to make. And given a lot of circumstances, I might avoid it completely. And it's not a heavy thing. It's just heavy to me. And it's like, I know God loves me. Is this in keeping with his love towards me? Or is this just something I feel like I need to do? All too often, we get in the way of our rest. I came up in a very faith-filled church <clears throat> as a young believer. You know, uh, those of you who know me closely, you, you, you know that when my wife and I actually left that fellowship after years, um, we had been involved in 14 different ministries. And simultaneously, when I say simultaneously, I'm talking about in the course of in the course of a week. So think about this. I had, I had my, my building business at the time. Or actually, yeah, I began, I had multiple stores and then I had my, you know, then I was doing contracting work. And we had children at home, young children. We at some point began to bring in, uh, people that had come out of prison into our home and lived with us. We were involved in all these ministries as well as Bible school, which meant Bible school requirements, you know, those kind of things. And I'm not, I'm saying this to say that we just thought if we put more faith to this, we could do this. I mean, I loved street witnessing. I loved, no, I didn't love door to door, but that was a requirement. I had to go door to door. I loved, you know, being on the worship team. I loved being an usher. I loved these things. They were great for me. But when we left, it was like somebody took a balloon that had been filled with ministry and collapsed it and there was nothing left. And the, the challenge was to find God's place of rest. I would say, and my wife would tell you I said this, there'll be plenty of time for rest somewhere down the road. I wasn't looking for it. I was looking to see what I could do because I believe to be more than an overcomer through Christ Jesus who strengthened me was to always be in overcoming mode. And it shortchanged a lot of things. It had costs that I don't think are realistic in the kingdom of God. I meet with a lot of young people. And I say young not to, dis, to you know, but why I say that is because many of the people I meet with have had parents who have been involved in ministry or ministries or have been the ministers themselves. And one of the cries was, where is my dad? Where is my mom? Now, when you're in that mode of ministry, it's easy to fall back and pull a scripture out of your hat and say, You know, Jesus talking about putting your hand to the plow, you know, I have, you know, I have a family and Jesus is, you know, people interpret that 
excuse me, that Jesus is saying that's not important. You know, let the dead bury their dead. There'll be all these times and we throw out all these scriptures, which, which are valid scriptures, until they invalidate love. Not that God stopped loving you, but you stop participating in the act of love of a spouse or family or friends. I, at this juncture of my life, do not do a lot of things that I can or that I would have. For instance, in my fellowship, I am not a pastoral gift. I am the first one to say that. If, you, if you're new to that teaching, Ephesians 4.11, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, my grace tends to be in the area of the prophetic. It doesn't mean that I'm not a father to people. Feel you know, on a regular basis, I have people who say, "Will you be a dad in my life?" And the answer is going to be yes if I believe that's the leading of the Lord. I am willing to make that sacrifice because sometimes it is sacrificial. But I do not want to lose my place of rest. I do not want to walk away from something that leaves me not in a good place. Hey, Lee met with me. It was great. Hey, Lee met with you and he's burnt out. I won't do that. A friend of mine said to me earlier this week, or maybe it was last week now, said, um, are you taking care of yourself? And the answer is yes. I was a little tired because some things that I didn't plan on came up and I'm not going to lie to you. The thing I was talking about, some of the things that are emotional to me began to get to me a little bit. And rather than pulling back and saying, okay, why is this emotional? What can I do about it? Cast my cares upon the Lord because he cares for me. Don't let other things exalt themselves against the name of Jesus and the practices of faith in my life and all that stuff. I started to let those things weigh me down. And my friend reaching out to me, which is one of the reasons I love people reaching out to me. Because sometimes I just really need to hear from them. And sometimes I really need to hear what they have to say to me. And sometimes they have really good counsel for me. So I'm probably going to add a little more this week about rest. I feel like I want to share a couple of other principles and they'll be available on YouTube and things like that. But more than anything, I want you to know that God wants you to be in a place of rest. He does not want you to have worry. He does not want you to have anxiety. He does not want you to walk in fear. He wants you to believe in him. You know, again, I meet with a lot of people who are not part of the church and they'll tell me, I believe in Jesus. I don't believe in the church. Through subsequent conversations, I get to explain that it's really hard to separate those things, but I understand where they initially come from. You know, I have young friends who grew up in families of ministry who won't darken the door of a church building because they never got to hang out with their folks. Um, I have other friends that, are, that were abused or hurt in the church, and my counsel to them is, why would you separate yourself from the very thing that God created to provide love for you? Now, have people taken advantage of that? Oh, yeah. Have people manipulated, hurt, and abused people? Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's good and godly people who want to bring comfort. You know, we've, we've been wired for communion with him and with you. And so that's where we're going to go this morning. We're going to take communion. I didn't mention it in the beginning. and I apologize. But if you've not taken communion before, or it's been a while, or I want you to know that this is an open table. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and... He distributed it to each one of his disciples. And he said, this is my body. 
as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. This is a reminder to me when I take this, that God is good and God is great. But so are you. So are you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Greater is he who dwells within you than he who dwells within the world. When we cast down the thoughts and, 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 and thinkings that want to exalt themselves against the goodness of God, we begin to come into that place of rest. So when you take this today, be reminded that this is also representative of our rest. And in like fashion, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is my blood, the signifying of a new covenant. I look into this cup, that's the blood of Jesus, and I see my reflection. And I know that in, my, in the blood, in this cup, my reflection is significant of not just the price he paid for me, not just the sin that was paid for, but of something so amazing that I cannot walk away from it. This week, <clears throat> if you need to shut off your social media, well, let me, let me back up one second. If you've been struggling with peace, if you haven't felt at rest, if you have not, if the things that I talked about are not part of your life, the good things that I was talking about are not part of your life, then I want to encourage you to pick one thing. One thing, find one scripture that I gave you earlier, write it out on an index card if they still make those, Put it, you know, hang it on your computer. And before you do, turn on your anything, your email, your social media, your games, whatever it is, tape it to the top of your laptop. Read that scripture out loud, whatever that scripture is. And take a moment and say, God, I want to be more like you. And then you can flip the index card over to the other side and you can pursue what you need to pursue. Meditate upon his word. If you're struggling to be at peace, lie down on the couch, on your bed, go sit in the chair outside and say, God, God, invade my life. Invade my life. Even as I'm saying that, there are some of you who are wanting and desirous of an encounter. Father, I release encounters with you this morning. I release those things. I declare that those things that have hindered my sisters and my brothers right now in the name of Jesus, I remove those hindrances and I declare that you have full access to the lives of my brothers and sisters that your kingdom come and your will be done in the lives of theirs. And I want to hear your testimony. If you had an encounter when you watched this, would you share that with others? Not because it's not me. Your encounter is with God. I'm just the vehicle reminding you that encounters are great things. If you've meditated upon that scripture and it began to give you peace, Tell the world, tell the world, and do not let the enemy eat your lunch unless it's sweet potatoes. And I'm kidding, if you don't know me, sweet potatoes are my nemesis. If it's sweet potatoes, let them have it. Otherwise, don't let the enemy of your soul steal your lunch. 
So Father, in the name of Jesus, I just release your presence over each and every person who watches this morning. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for the grace that grows us up. I thank you that we live faith to faith and glory to glory. That this morning, Lord God, you would be glorified in me. That you would be glorified in my body. That you would be glorified in the representative body that that cracker this morning represented. That your kingdom would come and that the new covenant would be established afresh in people's lives and that even as they take the cup Lord God and they look and they see their pretty face they know that 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 is their Genesis face who they were created to be it tells us in the book of James that you look into the word and you don't see somebody who's destined for destruction but you say I am good because the Lord said that God bless you Hopefully you'll be in touch with all your great testimonies. I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, for my fellowship, this week we'll be having a home group. Uh, and next Sunday we'll be gathering in my home. So I love you lots. God bless you.